sometimes uh, I, I too fall into calling these prayers, but really they're um, guided meditations, aren't they? So we're, we, we say them fast, you know, because it's just fast, but, um, uh, you know, if, if people said, I, I want something to daily practice, I'm always going to say, please do your um, calm abiding practice, 24 minutes, um, but also just um, do these uh, guided meditations, right? Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't take it doesn't take that long to go through these, right? Maybe um, twelve minutes or something. You know, although we're rushing, so if you um, maybe at some point we'll get a sponsor that will sponsor like uh, the, these um, meditations, and then we can hand them out. That would be nice too. So uh, I don't know if we have them on the website or not. We used to, but maybe hard to find. These are um, uh, prayers is, is an okay word, but generally we wouldn't say the Heart Sutra is a prayer. Heart Sutra is just like, this is the way it is, guys. That's it. So they're, they're meditations. I would like to welcome um, newcomers and old timers here. So oh. thank you for being here today. Um, the, Topic of the talk. What is the topic? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So um we do a lot of things, uh, a lot of teachings, a lot of activities at Lines Roar, and I wanted to uh you know put it into perspective. <clears throat> My uh uh Root teacher, uh, Gishi Vasan Gyatso Lao Kansan Sergei, um, was an uh, interesting person. Yeah, Laurampa Gishi, um, it's very difficult, that style, uh, that degree, and also uh, very much a Mahasiddha kind of person. And he had some very um, strong opinions about things, as teachers do. Um, being enlightened or being a Buddha doesn't mean you don't have strong opinions. You recognize their opinions, um, not necessarily truths, but um, <clears throat> he believed that the, um, the large monasteries that evolved in India, like Nalanda, Odantapuri, Vikramashila, um, were uh, a little bit like... Um, closer to like English universities like Oxford or something like that, or Cambridge, where um, the, the study programs were um, not as structured as they became in Tibet. So there were groups, uh, there were teachers who specialized in things, um, and you would go study with those teachers if, you know, where you were drawn to that. And of course there were um, always group ceremonies um, to do together, holidays and so forth. But um, other than that, um, you know, people were kind of a little bit left on their own to find a teacher in the monastery and to study the um, particular style. So people, some you'd find people that were the meditators, you'd find people that were the scholars, you'd find people that were the doers uh, making things and ritual people. You'd find the social worker type monastics and um, the cultural people, the artists, you know, and, and people would just gravitate. And then um, in a certain way, um, uh, I would uh, compare it to like uh, improvisational jazz rather than um, classical music written down, something like that. Um, there, there, there really weren't um, degrees in the same way. You know, we think of degrees or study programs. Um, people would kind of be known by a little bit by acclamation. Like people would go, you know, just like maybe we have musicians and artists or you know like that. We've seen that body of work. We've seen that person, and and they've got something going, but. 
they may or may not have an MFA or something like that, you know. <clears throat> However, when um, Atisha went, one of the main uh, abbots uh, was invited to Tibet in the um, 11th century. Uh, uh, he uh, went only with Tara's um, entreaty. He didn't really want to go. Why would you want to leave India, climb all over these mountains, go to Tibet? You know, like, I don't know, you know, it'd be, uh, they were just considered like uncouth, unwashed barbarians, you know, warlike and clueless. But um, he went and stayed for over 15 years and may have passed away there. But um, he was one of the first teachers that wrote um, texts because he felt the Tibetans needed that, some kind of structure. So anyway, he was the first person that wrote what became to known as Lam Rim or Stages of the Path. He saw it very disorganized and thought, okay, this needs to be some structure here. <clears throat> And later, um, in the 14th century, Lama Tsongkhapa felt a similar situation. Things were um, kind of disorganized. And as an organizer kind of type person, he wanted to like get a real course of study going um, and um, uh, you know, have a kind of a discipline kind of approach, right? So uh, you you wouldn't just learn music by hanging out with musicians, you know, you, you had to get your MFA from Juilliard or something like that, you know, or Berkeley School of Music. Something. So he did a lot of writing, as we know, and organized, you know, uh, Gondon, the main monastery, and his students, uh, the other two main monasteries, and developed this um, course of study and, you know, degrees and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And we have a similar thing uh, in the West now. You know, we have you know bachelor's, master's, doctorate, postdoctorate. Um, but in case don't point out that this is was um, uh, really a creation for Tibetans because they were so disorganized. Uh, likewise, the what some people know is the Nindro practice or foundation practices weren't um, organized that way in India. They or they became organized that way in um, uh, Tibet because the teachers felt there was a need for more foundation work and discipline and um, you know like foundational schools like we want you to learn arithmetic and math and stuff like that. A um, uh, few people once in a while poke up and say Lama we used to teach the Nindro. And then, then it kind of dies down, you know. So that I'm, it's always kind of curious. But um, I'm going to uh, provide as much structure as people need, right? But um, I've also noted in America, uh, I call it California style. There's the begging for structure, but then there's this kind of pushback. <laughs> you know, just tell me what to do. So I always know. Same with Dharma students. Same with therapy clients. When people say, "Tell me." just what to do, I was not, oh God, I'm going to hit some resistance here. <laughs> That's okay, you work with it. But um, the style here at Lion's Roar is a little bit mix of my teacher, who was very educated in a very traditional, very disciplined style, but also had, um, I guess that what I think of most is, you know, kind of a jazz style improv style um, in addition to being you know trained classically uh, so we, we do classical training here but um, it's blended with a certain improv style the the benefit of uh, stages of the past style it's like steps right you know you're you're going you can count the steps like how many steps to the top of the landing you know moves psychotherapy offices so I don't have stairs anymore which is nice but I had to count the stairs because people would ask I was 18 and you make it up 18 steps and people go well, I'll make it up 15 or something <laughs> no so you, you know um, uh, and they're generally steps are they're they're all the same right it would be kind of an Alice in Wonderland thing if 
one step was kind of like three inches and then the next step was like this and you know like um so each step is even and you know how many steps you're going to do and you can kind of um, retrace your steps like all that um the a little bit downside of the tap step process is um there's a sense of leaving behind the steps you see you're thinking well i don't need the bottom step anymore because i'm at the top right um so that that becomes a problem where teachers in a traditional style and, and the step style long room style have to remind people not to forget about the the basics right so you, you've gotten to this next step but then um don't forget you 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 know you, you the step below you needed to stay in place right <clears throat> um the probably that uh, what my teacher felt and it's hard to know what actually went on in the monasteries before um in india between you know 600 bc and around 1000 because basically they were wiped out through the different muslim invasions right so it burned you know so we don't really know what they did other than the tibetans tried to recreate it but they made something different right <clears throat> so um the value of a tutorial style and uh, a, a little bit what I would call a, um, a circular or labyrinth style is um, in, a, in a labyrinth like, um, I'm fond of labyrinths by the way, um, like the labyrinth of Chart or that has become popular, right? Anybody ever walk labyrinths around town? Okay. As what's very interesting is um, of course, there are a lot of switchbacks, and it uh, in the short labyrinth style, it looks like at first you're going right for the center, right? And then it makes it abrupt, you know, uh, left hand kind of clockwise turn. And then you do a little circle, and oh, I'll get there pretty soon. But then, then, then it starts leading you way out to the fringe, and you spend, you know, a long time out on the fringe uh, but if you persevere you 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 do you just keep following it because there's no blockages like a maze keep following it you'll get at the center the row center so there's a, a profound method here and message that um um you know if, if you keep going you'll get there but there are a lot of switchbacks but um it's different than um a straight step style because um, straight step style would be, I just want to go right to the center. With the maze, you cover the entire territory. That's really important. The entire territory is covered. You're, you've walked every little piece of earth or flagstone or whatever. Whereas step style, you're, you're kind of leaving things behind a little bit. You can go straight like that. Both are important. I want to emphasize that. Both are important. Um, so myself, uh, my teacher said, well, do both, you know, do uh, step style, but also uh, labyrinth style. Um, labyrinth style is a little bit more Mahasiddha style, a little bit more because um, the person has to surrender a little bit more because the teacher will go, well, now I, I think you need to be doing this practice. Or, or the student might go, I think I need to be doing this practice. And you you talk about it rather than the next course is, you know, blah, blah, right? Um, that does appeal to people that want to know exactly what's happening next. Um, uh, you know, just I just want to know what's next, and I'll be prepared for it, and I'll do a good job, and I'll get rewarded, and I won't be punished. Got, got it. Um, and that's important, because I there are times when steps are necessary, particularly with procedures like... Um, you know, particularly like medical procedures and psychological procedures too in Dharma is like, yeah, it does make a difference what you do in, in, in a certain order, you know? So uh, we don't want you just kind of like, well, we're going to just try this. You know, we, we do want to know like, okay, this is this is indicated when this is happening. But um, the, the, the limitation too of a step style is it's not real life. Okay. it's not real life so uh that's why uh 
everybody that goes through a course of study, particularly maybe in, in medicine um, or in psychotherapy, uh, then they're suddenly doing their internship and like, this wasn't in grad school or this wasn't in med school or something, you know? Um, why not? <laughs> um, so uh, the labyrinth style, the spontaneous jazz style um, is very experiential, but also if someone's not disciplined or not really motivated, then they can easily just be futzing. And it's hard to know is sometimes is anybody really doing anything where the step style we can know like, well, you didn't memorize that text or you didn't do this. So you, you, you haven't had that kind of insight because we asked and you don't know what two plus two is for. So start over. Um, so sometimes with the, uh, um, I'm calling like jazz or Lavin style is it's hard to know, uh, almost tell a performance that, um, you know, someone's actually doing the job. A very good example of uh, labyrinth or jazz style is one of the most beloved teachers from the Indian tradition, Shanti Deva. Right? Shanti Deva is nice. So Shanti peace, Deva, the divine peace. Wouldn't that be nice to have that name, Shanti Deva? <clears throat> so uh, Shanti Deva um, was a monk at. Um, uh, Nalanda and well, it was Nalanda, not, but in any case, um, he was perceived by the fellow monastics as, as being, you know, a slacker and um, would would just do the, the very minimum. If monks are even now, like, you can kind of be a slacker, people will think you're a slacker and group approval or disapproval can be very strong, but they're not going to kick you out. You have to like really do something egregious. So they tolerated him, but they were still like, how do we get, this is just not good. He's just eating, he's getting fat and he's not doing anything, you know, useless. Um, so of course they, um, they wanted to trick him and uh, monasteries are full of practical jokes. I like practical jokes. I can only do them with a few people that like practical jokes, but anyway, so they said um, they wanted to humiliate him. So they asked, would you be willing to give the Dharma talk? Um, and they wanted to further humiliate him because they thought it was a dunce, basically, by saying, would you like to give a talk on a classical text or would you like something of your own composition, right? So he totally surprised them. So, oh, I'll do, an, um, I'll do my own composition, right? So people know the story that um, he gave a you know an incredible talk, and then um, it says he, he kind of floated up in the air and left. You know, um, you know my guess is he somehow said you know the work my work is done here, and then went to do a lot of meditation in the jungle. Um, what's interesting is there are different versions of. Um, Shantideva's Bodhicharavatara. So we know that even back then, um, people were taking notes. Okay. You know, just like some of you are taking notes. You know, people are taking notes and people write down different things, right? Just like um, uh, a long room text that's kind of uh, somewhat contemporary. Uh, put in the palm of your hand, Pabanka Rimshe, you know, was put together by Trija Rimshe. I, I, I don't know how he took those notes. You know, anybody read, you know, the book's that thick in English and um, he lectured. First of all, it's amazing that somebody just kind of lectures day after day, <laughs> like Pabanka Rimshe has no notes, you know, just like, nude. and Trija Rimshe, I, Tivin's not easy to write, you know, and how do you do it real fast, right? Oh, well, no, it's crazy. But, um, so Shanti Deva was that kind of person that looked like wasn't doing anything, but absorbing in, in a different way than in the classical study. So here at Lion Source, sometimes people get frustrated, like there's maybe too much, too much uh, classical stuff, like, oh, do we need another teacher coming? You know? Yeah, well, we are. We're gonna have this incredible teacher, Ken Sorim Shea, who's coming. Um, 
uh, this Friday night and, and Saturday to do Vajrasattva. Um, <clears throat> he's a very interesting, just a little side, really interesting person who's um, like, what, 84, 85, right? 85, you know, you never know it. He's incredibly energetic. So he's somebody that has combined the scholarship and the yoga qualities and the Mahasiddhi qualities in incredible ways. His, and, you know, I'm just be a little woo woo for you guys. His energy field is incredible, right? So uh, just uh, when we're not preoccupied with our own bullshit, you can actually feel other people. And, <laughs> you know, and just being around us, like, you know, so I really enjoy his presence. So um, we we can get the intellectual piece uh, through uh, or Zoom, but um, and and maybe you can get through Zoom. I don't know. Some people are very uh, they, maybe they can pick up things that way, but um, uh, it, it is different being you know in in someone's actual embodied presence, right? It makes a difference. So. Um, Sometimes people are like, okay, he's giving a talk, and, and then four classes of Tantra, which is really important, and then Vajrasattva, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's kind of classical. Um, but um, he also has that um, jazz quality. He's very spontaneous, you know. He'll pick up, you know. That's what's really interesting. Like, yeah, same way with Ling Rinpoche, you know, he's like very, very attuned, you know, like you're just kind of, do something and he'll you know people are rigid you can they'll just stay in their box you know but uh Ling Rim Shay just like uh Kins Rim Shay like you know you'll move this way and he'll move this way. <laughs> you know it's it's really like a dance or a, a Tai Chi thing. Sometimes you can feel that right you know like teachers moving and you'll you know and then you click into harmony and uh you know, then, uh, uh, you know, there, there's something special that isn't just, um, you know, information, right? So I had that experience when he goes, oh, yeah, was like, yeah, we knew each other at Sarah G last lifetime, you know, yeah, 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 you know, it's weird, you can pick that up, right? And then, then the whole thing opens up, you know, it's kind of like, ooh, this is not just a visit, right? It's not just like, Oh, someone's giving a talk. Um, this is continuity, right? That's different, right? It's not just information like, ooh, there's that thread, you know, golden thread that extends. So, of course, making aspirations already to to see constraints. <laughs> like uh, my next lifetime and his too, right? Doesn't stop here. I'm going, oh, I'm, I'm going to keep meeting this person, right? This is, I'm not losing track of this person, right? It's like we're not losing track of Ling Rinpoche, right? You know, like, because there's the, all the teachers that I like to come here, these are people like, oh, if do you want to continue your practice and, and not worry, you know, then to say, all right, all right, I'm going along on this journey with these folks, right? So make aspirations. I'm not thinking like, just like Kinsu Rinpoche, come back next year again. You know, I'm thinking, well, I want to meet up with this person. Uh, the power of intention is so strong that um, you can do that. So it's really interesting. So people sometimes worry about um, being in the bardo after death things and you know getting the visualizations right. You know they're reading Tibetan Book of the Dead or which is its nickname and you know what happens on day three. You know, but you don't need to know that. You know. If you just go, okay, I'm just uh, remembering my teacher, then there's, there's nothing else you need to remember, right? So that's why I say if, you, if you're on, on I-80, you just kind of go, oh, I, I, I just I want to go to San Francisco, so I just stay on I-80, right? And Sacramento, but in India too, and particularly in Carmichael, the power goes out for no reason, you know, but, um, uh, you know, if you just wait a minute, it'll come back on. So if the room goes dark and the power's off, should you jump up immediately? No, because <laughs> you'll trip over something maybe. So it's just like that. So 
for a second, you go through a transition, things go dark, but uh, they go light first, right? You first see the light, um, the clear light, um, but then they go dark and then people freak out, right? Yeah, now, now I'm screwed, missed the clear light, right? People talk to me and I'm like, I'm, you know, I think I missed it, I'm gonna miss it. You won't miss it, it'll come back on again. You know, just go, Lama Kenna, Lama Kenna, Lama Sini, you know? Yeah, you know, it's like, welcome back. So, so the, the program here is very much a mix of classical style, which has incredible ability to, um, uh, you know, uh, keep people moving in the path, right? Just keep doing the steps. Um, but just just doing the steps, uh, sometimes people can master material, but they haven't done the inner work, right, as much. Um, but then sometimes people are, you know, like the jazzy labyrinth kind of types, but um, they're uh, not as disciplined. The value of combining both is that you have the flexibility of the jazz and the discipline of the uh, structure. Um, when those two are combined, then you can respond to the world very powerfully. See, otherwise you don't, you're, you know, when there's a crisis that comes up, if you don't have any idea how to deal with things, you know, you, you, you don't have the discipline. You see, if you don't have the discipline, you won't know a crisis will come up, which is really what it means is a rapid change of, you know, impermanence rapidly, right? It's a crisis. Um, so you'll freak out because you were just kind of going with the flow, right? So a disciplined person will know, okay, when, when this happens, I do this, you know, I, I know what, you know, and, um, so if somebody's blood pressure is uh, 200 over 100, what should that tell you? Anybody? Emergency <laughs> What some people might not know, I was like, oh, I don't know, just put a cuff on, it's 200 over 120. Um, I don't know, that sounds like a good stretch, you know. I, I, you know, what? so if somebody disciplined will know, okay, this is, or, you know, like you've got a child at a picnic and, uh, you know, they just had a peanut butter sandwich and they're in anaphylactic shock. Like, what do we do? Anybody? EpiPen, EpiPen, yeah. It's good to know this stuff. You know, that's that comes from that comes from discipline, trial and error, going step by step. You know, like that that style was like years and years. We've learned that this doesn't work. You know, so you don't have to like float over to that you know part of the lake. You know, that doesn't work to go over there. Um, but then sometimes you know people. Um, they, because they have discipline, they think that the world should act that way. But it doesn't, right? So the, the flexibility and the improv, the creative uh, thing has to also be there and put it in balance. So let me stop there. I hope I've repeated myself three times so that it should be completely clear and obvious, but I'm also willing to be challenged. So I do like debate actually. There wasn't, there probably was not, um, there, there was not the formal debate in, in, the India, in India exactly the way that Tibetans evolved it. Tibetans have really um, uh, made it, you know, they really refined it, you know, so like that. But I think, I think it, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as refined. Um, uh, and in India, uh, I would say, briefly while you're thinking of your questions or comments. Um, people really did a lot of meditation. People really, there was a strong, strong, and still is a strong, strong tradition of you've got to do a lot of yoga. That, and you, you've got to be willing to just hang in there and just do a lot and repeat it. India, uh, all the yoga traditions discovered, oh, learning happens through your repetition. You don't just kind of get it. You know, this incredible, you know, ability to um, 
you know, do deep yogic states, you know, like, um, so fortunately that also went up to Tibet. But let's, let's see, it's almost noon. So I've been talking too much. So someone wants to say something, they need the microphone. I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, you spoke a little bit about continuity and continuing relationships. No. How does that apply not to just teachers that haven't been here, but to like Jadarubishe or Geshe Dongsho or yourself? How do we continue that continuity even when people move away or can't come very often or, uh, you know, things get canceled? And how do we yeah. as students handle that? So, um, I think that's particularly a particularly a strength um, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, um, in in India, um, most of the teachings that the Buddha did and the different yogis um, were uh, were on the plains, right, or the foothills. They weren't they weren't living in the mountains. A few mountain yogis, but you know. It's very difficult, you know, to travel in mountainous areas, and so strong um, memories of the teachers and prayers to the teachers um, really became even more important. Um, there was Guru Yoga, of course, coming out of India, but um, people, uh, you know, uh, developed even a stronger relationship. I think in some ways, so you're constantly bringing. Um, uh, your teacher to mind and the imagination um, uh, can be very strong, you know. So, I mean, every day I'm saying, Glorious your teacher, precious one, dwelling in the lotus seat of the crown of my head, told me with your great kindness, bestow the accomplishments of body, speech, and mind, you know, just always doing Guru Yoga, always, always, always like that. So, um, bring, just bringing people to mind. When you're in love with someone and you're in a good place, you're in a good place, you know, you're always bringing them to mind, you know, it's just, this is natural. It's just, you know, and even sometimes when they're gone for a while, you know, um, then the, the, the longing um, builds up even more. So in Guru Yoga, we try to um, use both the, the presence and the longing to, to positive effect like that. Um, so, uh, you know, and it, it needs to be worked on because the tendency is we, we tend to forget about people, right? And that we, you know, that human beings are not, we're very positive oriented. So we'll remember things are right in our face, but we tend to see what's, we forget what's not there. So um, that's part of rituals is, is reenacting um, people's presence like that. But, um, the other thing is not just remembering, but um, you know, and, uh, you generally know, like teachers like myself know, if someone's practice is going well, then their sense of patience and gratitude is increasing, right? It's not that simple. So um, when people are you know, thinking about the positive qualities of their teachers, then they'll keep them in mind. And then they'll, you know, you'll have those qualities yourself like that. But, um, we, we also have to email and get on the phone and invite Chad and Shay. And um, of course, um, people know, you know, uh, Honor Tenzin Montauk. So we're, we're sending them to um, Mongolia to ask um, um, Chad and Shay in person to come to Sacramento to uh, bestow the full Kala Chakra empowerment, right? Which um, could be like a could be a three week deal. <laughs> we uh, we you know Geshe Dongcha and I you know are trying to bring um, Dalai Lama here in um, you know two thousand something, um, and the cause and conditions were correct at the time. But now I you know and I don't think da Dalai Lama is coming. You know he's um it's bringing people to Dhamsala as he should. Um but um Jada Rimshe, I think would come. So these things are really important to do in person sometimes. So it means a lot to in traditional cultures like Tibetan culture, um, not just to send an email. 
<laughs> or just like a telephone call, you know, but actually, oh, I traveled halfway around the world uh, and I'm hanging out for a couple of weeks and uh, we're asking to come. So I've asked people to help sponsor the, the trip, you know, so um, I do hope kind of has a good time, but it's really a Bodhisattva self activity to, you know, go and, um, uh, you know, ask permission. These kinds of things, there's lots of times you, uh, I'm, I'm kind of privileged with Jadarim She, so, um, but um, the traditional style is you'd, you'd approach um, an attendant um, and then they go, well, you'd give like an invitation and then go, um, well, you know, Rim She's very busy. Uh, and you go, yeah, I know, but yeah. and I don't. Know, there's there's a long ritual where you're basically um, feels like medicine now. Where you, they they say, okay, you're gonna wait in the waiting room, and then someone gets you, and then uh, this is Kaiser. I can always diss Kaiser, and then they say, wait, wait in this small little room for a while. <laughs> you you know. Then you wait in the room for like 25 minutes. Look, they're not, you know, it's like, like, and then they even move you again, you know, it's like, okay. But so anyway, that that does happen with, you know, with incredible teachers, you know, so you actually have to kind of camp out, you know, and then um, you have to kind of, you know, not, not be really annoying, but, you know, like be willing to suffer a little bit and um, stuff like that. Um, my teacher used to do that to me all the time. Um, that I've shared with a group um, that I just stuck in there because I'm stubborn. You know, I'd drive down to Carmel or Pacific Grove or wherever he was or different parts of the country and then he'd go, I don't feel like talking tonight, today. How many of you would do that? I'm like, well, you just join me 10 minutes ago. No, I have a darshan scheduled at three. And what if I said, um, yeah, it's not working for me. <laughs> wouldn't you wouldn't you be calling the Dalai Lama's office, you know? Call the BBS, you know, like it was quite abandonment, you know, something. So you know, that that's traditional. I'm like, oh, um, yeah, Abbott said it, you'd see you, but um it's, it's really been very busy. Yeah. So it takes a lot of guts to show up, travel, eat Mongolian food. Anyway, that helpful question answer session. Yeah. Uh, Ellen has a hand up. Thank you for the talk, Rinpoche. Uh, I had a question about something you said. You said something to the effect of not being afraid of not getting the clear light, that it will sort of come back around. And you're talking about, yeah. you know, the experience of electricity going out, coming back. And, and I know when my electricity goes out, I'm like trying like a dog to get on the PG&E website and find out exactly when it's going to come back. No. <laughs> and so one of the things I feel ch most challenged about my practice is having faith that that thing you tell us will happen will actually happen. So I don't I don't know if you're referring to like in many life, some lifetime in the future it'll come back or or what, but how do we keep the faith up not really having signs about when this event might occur even if it would even occur in our own lifetime so good question um i preface by saying um some students do need to like be very um uh everything's very predictable right so <laughs> psychology would say object relationship style, like psychoanalytically, like you wouldn't even move anything in your office, right? Right, Deb? You know, so everything's got to be just like, you know. um, but, um, uh, you know, as part of the, the, um, uh, the therapeutic temenos, as the unions would say, right? But um, you, you can't, real life can't sustain that, right? So for, her um, my style contains that sometimes a very I mean, actually kind of predictable, but the teacher has to constantly be going touch and go. 
I'm present and then I'm not. Because that's the way reality is. Reality is not like this. It's it's dash and go, dash, go, dash, go, like that. Um, so the Buddha discovered that. He says, no, it's not, there's, it's not a nothing. There's no nihilism, but it's not eternal either. It's not just one continuous line. Things are um, pulsating. So we have to train eventually to pulsating like that. But how do we train that um, in the Mahayana? Um, it, the the big the uh, the big thing uh, always is bodhicitta. So I am I'm training for uh, the benefit of others, but it also helps to have somebody specific in mind. You know, so it isn't just all sentient beings. You know, you you know, like I I. I want to like train for this person or this person is really important. So we, we really do personalize it. So there's this kind of, you know, really rescuing somebody from the burning house feel with uh, bodhicitta that, um, that keeps you going because you, if it's just for ourselves, well, we might give up. But, you know, when we have to, you know, you, you have to get the, you know, mythology, you have to get the elixir to heal someone out, you know from the dragon's jaws right you know you you might not do it for yourself but you do it for someone you love so um that becomes um more powerful than the fear like that um uh yeah so it, sometimes the, you know um the dark night of the soul is longer for some people than others <laughs> so uh there's you know, we're not looking to prolong it, you know, but um, it, it it's also going to be rhythmic. First things appear and then they disappear. This is, this is impermanence. Yeah, but it's bodhicitta that, um, that uh, is the motivator. Uh, so um, one of the um, main teachers of the 20th century, of course, um, and one of the teachers of Dalai Lama, um, important teacher, particularly in Yingma tradition, Dingo Kense Rimshe, um, uh, was asked once, you know, um, um, what do we need to know about, you know, um, the dying process and, you know, the whole thing, right? <laughs> you know, uh, dissolution in the body and the bardo and, you know, everything. And what do you think he said? Bodhicitta. Yeah, okay, just, um, or, you know, he, he just was even, you know, just, um, just do, do a meditation, you know, just kind of, like, from the Baharas, just, may all beings be free and happy, and, and, and you know, like, bodhicitta, it's, it is the beginning and the end, I mean, it's the, the grail, it's the elixir, right, so that, um, uh, but, you know, we forget it and we, we all get scared and we'd like to know what's what's going to happen next. But, um, uh, you know, we um, we should know, like, what's going to happen next. So also a famous, like, 16th Karmapa who met several times. I was died in Zion, Illinois, you know, outside of Chicago. <laughs> and... Uh, it's famous, I think, at that time, uh, the Sultans in the region said, you know, like, what happens? And uh, the Karmapa said what? Nothing. If we've already realized emptiness, it's not going to be another emptiness, right? It can't be. It's not boring. It's not emptiness. It's not boring. But the, the, it, you know, that comes. The the absolute certainty um, does come through study and meditation. You know, so and, and the bodhicitta and the guru yoga they all come together. I'm like, well, I mean, actually, nothing that I've, you know, it it could be a different appearance for sure, right? But it it won't be essentially different. So my 
my old teacher used to say, well, you're already dead. Do you, do you want to know what death is like? It's just like this. There'll be appearances and then there'll be no appearances. And are you happy with your consciousness right now? If you are, then there shouldn't be any problem. Yes. Anybody else? No. And are there any online questions or comments? What I thought of while you were describing the education paths, I'll call them the labyrinth and the, the stair step, is yeah. um, the second law of thermodynamics is the amount of disorder in the universe is always increasing. When you describe the labyrinth um, process, and it seems like things go, un for lack of a better word, um, chaotically unplanned, there still seems to be some order being created. And maybe this is more of a comment than a question, but it's like, is it almost maybe like a, a process that defies physics? and spontaneously generates order um, or like a process where order can be created on its own without um, necessarily without um, work and effort. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Good. That's a, that's a good talk right there. You know, so um, of course, you know, labyrinth has its own kind of order obviously, because we can see the form and we can say, just stick with it. So, but the the way it feels to be walking labyrinth feels different than walking steps because it uh, it doesn't feel like you're getting anywhere, you know, and then it suddenly feels like you're going further away. Um, but then at some point you realize you've covered the whole territory. Um, so it, it does this labyrinth order and, um, uh, stair order, I call it. Um, so that's why mandalas, you know, just to add a little bit, mandalas are um, so important and we don't talk about them that much. We we have a, an example of uh, an aerial view of the Kala Chakra mandala, of course, right behind you, um, which contains stairs and circles and squares. Um, and uh, each one of those is a different... Um, uh, pattern representing, you know, different skandhas and different aspects, right? So um, in a full practice like Kala Chakra, we, um, we, we see different kinds of order going on. But the, um, the Vajrayana approach is, uh, yes, even in the midst of what appears to be extreme chaos or disintegration or, or a new creation, there's intelligence and order order happening, um, but it it does take some special training to see it. You know, um, not all the truths are um, uh, immediately available without special instruction. So that's a little bit what's different between my kind of secular and sacred dharma. Secular a little bit in the West now is like, well, we, you know, what, you know. We'll believe what we can see with ordinary perception, right? But uh, sacred dharma is saying, well, you, you need to have extraordinary perception to see what we're talking about. Um, some things can be seen scientifically just with the naked eye, you know? <laughs> Newton saw the apple drop, but other things need, you know, um, electron microscopes like that. But uh, the getting that balance of order and disorder is is the middle way, of course. It's really a big deal because um, Shakyamuni, you know, was, was explored both sides. It's not disorder. It's not order. You know, this this weird thing um, called the middle. You know, so he spent his whole teaching career putting out different metaphors and practices for that. But if you're practicing correctly, it feels like um, you know you're. Um, you're, you're building up and taking apart at the same time. 
right? You know, it feels your life falling apart and it's uh, getting creative at the same time. It's like that. And most of the time, from society's point of view, you end up feeling kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. I think we have one more question. In the okay. audience now. You, you kind of, I don't know, you might have answered it already, but um, as you were speaking uh, about the stir steps and the labyrinth, I thought of safety and discomfort so the safety kind of being like the stair steps and then discomfort being like the labyrinth and I guess like I'm wondering you you just talked about building up and breaking it down does there come but there does there come a point where the safety is like non-existent like there is no ground there's no floor this stable thing that you thought existed is just gone and you're kind of um, yeah. that's a good question. So, um, when we're talking about the, um, level of Mahamudra and, um, Dzogchen, there's definitely a sense of leap, right? Um, <clears throat> so once you've you know, literally left the diving board, um, there's no going back, right? However, um, we have this lineage and tradition which which says, please check the depth of the water first. Okay, so at least while we're practicing. Um, so Buddha Dharma is different than some kind of um, little nihilistic traditions, which is just kind of Russian roulette spirituality or, you know, just kind of um, let it fly, and maybe you'll be one of the lucky ones, you know. Um, so, but there, there is a point in the practice where our traditional sense of safety and reference points do totally dissolve. But the idea at that point, we we know how to dive and fly. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'd like to be known as a teacher that doesn't push people off. The diving board. People ask for that. I'd have I'd have a huge center and um, you know, kind of this power thing. You know, people are attracted to power. I want somebody that's gonna push me off the diving board, right? Um, because I, I don't I'm too scared to do it myself. So I'm gonna hire some dictator to do it, you know. Um we really don't want that. Uh, you know, but you also don't you you, you don't uh you, you need to get the bounce. So when you say the leap, you, you get this kind of, that, and reality has a sense of bounce to it. But definitely once you're in the air, um, you know, in some sense, anything could happen. Um, but uh, we've been trained, you know, so um, we, we're cautious. You know, at first you're training students and you go, well, okay, just bounce on that. Used to be a camp counselor, so you know, you, you, you know, like there, you know, it's almost like you know, systematic desensitization. You know, some kids don't want to dive, so they, here's the, here's the diving, here's the diving board, and here's okay, get in, get in the pool, and the pool's like 15 feet deep. There's no way, you know, and you're only like five feet, so you know, and da -da -da, and you know, bounce on the board and then go back, and you know, or you know, like okay, you know, strap a life jacket and then dive you know there's so much of the step style is that way because um we're not we're not really interested in um you know shaming someone to dive either which is a huge part in religious traditions too sometimes like shaming in a coachy kind of way is something i really don't know you can do it you can do it yeah do it well sometimes they can't do it they're not ready to do it you know um, or, you know, don't be aware, it's doing, um, you know, truth of day or kind of style. Feel good. Um, I, I have gone through that phase in my life, by the way. So, transparency. Um, so, but even so, there's, um, uh, th there's, you know, we have to confront our fear at that point. You know, even, uh, 
you know, even the most, um, I'm the kind of person, because I'm used to it now. See, I can talk to a teacher um, in the Tibetan of, oh, what's, you know, what's been kind of scary for you recently? But traditionally in Asia, you've never, you know, you're not going to raise your hand and say to, you know, to Cancer Roche coming, like, anything been scary recently? But, but, but some teachers will answer that, you know. Of course, we're all scared. Like, look at the world, right? If you're not a little scared, you're not paying attention, right? Is that not true? Anybody doubt that? You know, we should be kind of like, ooh, I'm running a little adrenaline right now. I don't know about you guys, right? So um, I remember like the Cuban Missile Crisis, you know, we were, you know, duck and cover. And it's like, that was so weird <laughs> for people that you know, my age went through that. But I'm, I'm kind of at that, like, there's a lot of dumb stuff coming down now, you know? So I'm, I'm like this right now. Um, so we, we know there's there's always going to be something new, a little bit of apprehension. So people who say, you know, I'm just fine. We know, does anybody know what that stands for in, in recovery? We know that, right? What fine stands out? For fine, effed up, insecure, neurotic. And egotistical or emotional. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So that's what I loved about Ling Rim Shade. It's, you know, it's very honest. You know, it's great. It's like, well, what was, <laughs> what was your major thing? You know, the, well, basically, it was like, what was annoying about the visit here? He loved visit here, by the way. But he's just like, well, it was a long drive, man. You can trust someone like that, right? They're not kind of, you know, well, I loved everything about it. And it's like, love seeing you guys and teaching Dharma and, oh, long drive. <laughs> okay, we should close. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel of Bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rizik Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Low sound, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions, fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of monks. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Jagpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So a few announcements. Of course, um, Kinsurim Shea is coming here. Uh, am I still on here? No, disappeared. Yeah, so um, he's doing the Vajrasattva. Vajrasattva practice uh, is very important, not only on Dzogchen level, but um, Nundra level and daily level. So Vajrasattva is like, when you say purification practice, um, it sounds sometimes too holy, but um, it's really a practice for us to um, reset, press the clear button, reset, and um, basically from, you know, to say, well, I'm... I made some mistakes or I went off, I'd like to make amends and I'm doing some practice and motivation to do that. So um, sometimes people think, well, um, like love story of the 60s, like true love means never having to say you're sorry. Of course I was wrong. And um, 
uh, we have to, if we love someone, we have to say we're sorry a lot, and I'll do better, you know, and we don't have to beat the crap out of ourselves. We just have to acknowledge, like, yeah, that wasn't my best, and I'm sorry, and I'd like to make amends. You know, this is how we stay sane, and you know, people stay in recovery. You know, so the Vajra Sutra practice is all about that. It's of course mythological with uh, an interesting looking Buddha who has one Vajra Sutra solo there, and there's one. Vajrasattva and embrace over there. So uh, it's an extremely important practice all the way up to Dzogchen. So um, that's really exciting. Uh, and then we have uh, Kenshin Ramshay coming to teach Arya Deva's 400 verses. And uh, we'll probably also be seeing Kansar Ramshay from um, Guto this summer, which would be great. Um, when people say, well, what should I come to? And how much practice should I do? I'm always going to say, do as much as you can. You know, so from my side, you know, it's always, the question is always kind of like, well, how much bodhicitta should I have? How much love should I have? Well, <laughs> what do you got? You got a thimble, you got a cup, you got a bathtub, you got, you know, reservoir. Um, with people you love, you know, you're not going to, you know, so I don't know. You know, I'm just I'm just doing what I love, so it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel doesn't feel like oh no, another person's coming. It doesn't feel crowded at all. You know, why would it? You know, so we all like our our meals. So if somebody says for the next umpty um the rest of your life, you have to eat maybe two or three or four meals. And like oh God, no, I. I you know, we love eat, we love our food, right? So people are going, right? Right. So Dharma is like food for me. So of course, yeah, it's it's easy. We're hosting our family and friends, and these people have vibrations that, if you're uh, in tune enough, you know, you just it's like getting this incredible uh, spa or a sound bath. You know, I like sound baths or just like that feeling, and you just kind of. So, um, of course, I like insights and so forth, but I will take good vibes, won't you? Do you want to be around really good vibes, around someone that's not angry, very peaceful and loving? If we're in tune with that, it's like it's like going to your EV station and being filled up again, right? So that's, initiation is, is when you have to give up something, you have to renounce harmful activities, the empowerment is when you're given the juice, right? So, you know, clean out your, empty your teacup of old tea, and then you can, right? Jesus said, you know, you know right? You know, get a new wine thing, right? So it's a wonderful opportunity this summer. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Appreciate it. Oh, my God.